This content is not suitable for children and may contain depictions of violence. Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast. So you may know about this week's episode. It's Christopher Wilder. Now, sorry for the the delays, but other than the missing in Michigan event that I did help out with, things have been very hectic on this new account that I'm on. I'm absolutely exhausted when I get home and so I may just be doing one episode every two weeks for a month or two until everything settles down a bit. Now you may know I was working at a major airline until the flu hit and that industry was pretty much decimated worldwide. So let's hope we all get over this thing, get the planes back in the air, (laughs) at least so I can go and see Kate again. Okay, let's get stuck into it. Now, my main reference from this episode is the book by Duncan McNabb called The Snapshot Killer. And it's definitely definitely worth a read or a listen if you have, say, Audible. I had to use Audible because, honestly, it's been so hectic I can only listen to these things. I can't read a book. Now, Wilder would be also known as the Beauty Queen Killer, so not just a snapshot killer. And these names came about because of his M.O., which we're going to get to as the story progresses. Now, let's get stuck right into it. Christopher Wilder was born in Sydney, Australia, on March the 13th, 1945, to his Australian mother, June, and American Naval Officer father, Coley Wilder. Now, June was from Ryde, that's northwest of Sydney, and this will become important later on. Coley Wilder was a Pearl Harbor and Battle of Midway veteran. Coley met June when he was stationed in Sydney towards the end of the Second World War while his damaged destroyer that he was posted on was being repaired. In April 1946, the family left Australia to go live in the USA and Coley Wilder stayed in the Navy. Being a military family, they would move from base to base around the country and Coley was also posted to the Philippines. Now, when Coley retired from the Navy in the late 50s, the family, now with two more boys, came back to Sydney to live in the Ride area near June's family, where they would have another boy. Now, Wilder, he nearly dialed at birth, and at three years old, he nearly drowned in a backyard pool, but he was revived. He was an average student who was more interested in sport. Now, in Australia, we're more into cricket and footy, whereas Wilder was more into baseball, which is pretty much an American thing. Now, he failed his intermediate certificate in Australia, which is the equivalent of year 10, and then he just left school. He was reasonably tall and good-looking. With his American accent, he was a little bit exotic, so to speak, you know. He wasn't a typical Aussie yobbo, and he used his Americanism to pull the girls. Now, it's said that in his teenage years, he would roam the neighbourhood and be a peeping Tom. At age 17, Wilder bought a White Morris Minor. Now, it's a bit of a shitbox, nowhere near a glamorous or sporty type of car, but it was a car, and that in itself, back in the day, was a cool thing. Wilder and his mates from Ride would pack the car with surfboards and check out the beaches north and south of Sydney. But they mostly ended up at Freshwater Beach, one north of Manly and the Queenscliff beaches. They became known as the Ride Boys and Freshwater became their local. Although Wilder's mates would surf the waves, he never rode a surfboard and hardly at all, if ever, went into the water. He saw the packed beaches during the summer school holidays not to swim, but to perv on young girls and women. At Freshwater Beach on the 4th of January 1963, Wilder was at the beach without his mates, but he started chatting to two other boys. They were mucking around with a couple of girls at the water's edge, and one of the girls was only 13. Next thing you know, the 13-year-old is being dragged into the back of Wilder's car under the pretense of driving her home. 
Wilder drove with one of the other boys in the back, of the back seat and the other in the passenger seat. The girl in the back seat got a bit worried when they passed her house and she tried to escape. Wilder drove to an abandoned quarry at Willandra Road at Beacon Hills. It's here that Wilder will rape this 13 year old girl and the two other boys will do nothing to stop him. And then it will drive her home as if nothing had happened. Now the girl would go to police with her mother and Wilder and the two other boys would be interviewed by them. Wilder and the two other boys were charged. Now Wilder was charged with rape and carnal knowledge and one of the other boys as being an associate to carnal knowledge and the other boy to assaulting the female. Now Wilder had a good lawyer and his family was respectable, his father being a war veteran. The two other guys didn't have the same resources or good family behind them. Now Wilder and his lawyer were able to sort of twist the story around to make the two other boys the instigators of the rape and that Wilder was actually drawn into the situation by them. He had the rape charges dismissed under a deal that he pled guilty to the lesser charge of carnal knowledge. Wilder's lawyer vigorously cross-examined the 13-year-old girl and they really can't do that nowadays, which is a, a good thing. But she kept saying it was all Wilder's idea, it was his. The other guys weren't the instigators at all, but even though they did nothing to help her, it was all Wilder. Wilder got a smack on the wrist with the judge saying, I don't think he'll do it again. He got a 12-month suspended sentence. The two other guys got nine months suspended sentences, even though, like I said, their only crime was the moral one of not going to the girl's defence while Wilder raped her. In January 1967, Wilder was at Palm Beach, north of Sydney, and it's here that he would meet his future wife. She was 20 year old with her 15 year old sister. The mother and father were also there. Now over weeks, he bumped into them a lot and he chatted with them and he soon got to know them quite well. But he was always placing most of his attention on the younger 15 year old until the father took him aside one day and told him that she's just too young for you, mate. This didn't deter Wilder. He just moved his attention to the 20 year old. Now one day he took this 20 year old to a secluded place and asked her to pose nude for him. Now she refused. They're not boyfriend or girlfriend, they're just hanging out together. So she refused and Wilder told her that if she didn't, he would force her to have sex. She told him she wouldn't go out with him again if, she, if he did it and he actually backed off at this stage. Even though he kept on and a few months later he was in a full sexual relationship with her. Now the family, they hated Wilder and wanted the daughter to stop seeing him. But as things happen, you tell the daughter not to, she's going to. She left home and lived in a shelter. Now get this, Wilder then went to the family home a few days later. He knew there was only the mother in the house because he, he, he just was a stalker, right? He let himself in via the open back door and with only the mother at home, now he startled her, he was standing in the middle of the hallway. Now Wilder started talking about sex with her and wanted her to have sex with him. He grabbed her by the arm, but she pulled away and told him she would kill him if he tried. She then told him to get out or she'd call the police. Now Wilder did leave, but he smashed the glass in the front door as he left. I mean, what the fuck? Still, the 20 year old daughter didn't leave him and they were married on the 27th of February, 1968. Wilder at this time had established a firm MO. He would go to the beaches, find young innocent girls and lure them into secluded places on the pretense that he was a modeling agent. Of course, the photo shoot soon turned to nude shoots and he would try to get sex as well. Later in the year, the marriage obviously wasn't going so well. At one stage, Wilder, his wife and the young sister were at a wedding now the wife had to go away for a little bit and then Wilder tried to get the young sister on her own. Now he almost did, but then a mother came out and saved her. Later, he would call her up and pretend to be a modeling agent and that he had seen her photos at that same wedding. Now at first the young girl was 
pretty flattered. This is a 13-year-old sister of his wife. Then she realised from the American accent that it was really Wilder on the phone and she hung up thinking he's just mucking around. But he called back using his Australian accent. But her mum answered. And that was, that was pretty much the end of that. She said, get the fuck out of here. Now, this is how creepy this guy was. In a relationship with one daughter, but he's trying to get the mother and her little sister into bed. Now, as I said, the marriage wasn't going well and a couple of strange things happened to his wife's car. First, the brakes failed. Then, the steering failed. Now, he was the only person working on this car. Then one day, she awoke to the strong smell of gas and the burners on the stove were on. Now, she would say that at first, the sex was normal, but then Wilder started to want sex more and more in more and more crazier positions and some of these would hurt her. He then progressed to anal sex, which he didn't enjoy, and he was becoming more and more violent. Then Wilder met a young nurse at the beach and told her she would be great as a model. Now, she declined his invitation at first for a photo shoot, but then Wilder was able to just keep talking to her and convince her to come with him. Long story short, he got nudes, and he also took motion film of her from a hand-cranked movie camera. Back then... You might have had a battery-powered one that was expensive. It wasn't like all the TikTok rubbish they've got now and everyone's got a video camera. These little things, you could hand-crank them and send them down to get developed. That's how it was. So he had one of these as well. Now, she was pretty embarrassed by what had happened and she said she only let him take the photos because he'd become threatening and she feared for her safety. But at this stage, Walden knew her name, her address, where she worked, So he ended up later calling her to meet up. She resisted at first, but then he used the threat of publishing those nudes to get her to comply. He met her at Manly Beach, but she brought a friend along with her. Now, Wilder changed tack here, and he told her that he would destroy her nude photos and negatives if she lured other girls in for him. Now, this is really Epstein and Maxwell type stuff. So... He did do this, she did do this, but one day Wilder demanded to meet her and he picked her up in his car. He told her to lay down in the back seat and drove to an apartment so she couldn't see where she'd gone. It's here that he raped her, and I will say rape, as this was non-consensual, as the only reason she let him have uh, sex with her was because he was blackmailing her with these photos. He then took her home, throwing what looked like a film canister out of the whip, window into a river as they drove over a bridge. Now this is while he's married and the young nurse would eventually tell her mother what had happened and they went down to the police. At the station she told the officer that she wanted this guy stopped but didn't want to go through a court case. She told them that the story about how she was approached to do a photo shoot then coerced into doing nudes and then she was blackmailed into providing him with other girls and eventually she was raped. Now, Wilder hadn't given her his correct name, but she remembered the rego on his car. Now, police were able to track him, and for a bit, they actually stalked him, making him him a bit uneasy, because he knew what was going on. At home, he would pace and look out the window for police cars. Eventually, they raided his place and discovered hundreds of photos of young women and girls, some nude, some wearing bikinis. Now, his wife was pretty shocked to see some of the girls were wearing her dresses and bikinis. Items she had before, she had no idea where they'd gone, how they'd gone missing. Now she know, knew where they were all gone. The police ended up telling the wife, just don't go back, move out. She did, and she never went back. Now, it would be his wife and her mother that would later tell police that they suspected Wilder as being the one who killed Marianne Schmidt and Christine Sharrick at Wanda Beach on the 11th of January, 1965. Now, this was one of the most shocking crimes in Australian history, and it was and is still unsolved up to today. Now, if you heard my original episode on the Wanda Beach murders or listened to last week's audio podcast, At first, I didn't have Wilder as the main suspect, but since researching this case, I now believe it was probably him that brutally raped and stabbed those two 15-year-old girls. He lived not far from them. He did look like the surfy type, and that was the type that was described as the boy that went off with with the two girls 
into the sand hills. Also, I think that he actually knew them in ride. He organised to meet them at Cronulla. And that's why they went out that day. It wasn't a really good day for the beach, that they were really excited to go out that day. I think he pre-planned meeting them there. And that's why they walked off with him. And, well, they ended up dead. Now, fearing that he would be suspected of any rape that occurred up and down the beaches of Sydney, Wilder ended up taking off to live in, in the USA in 1969. The close calls in Australia with the police were a world away from the beaches of Florida, where Wilder would further hone his skills. Now, being a dual citizen, he was able to come and go from both countries quite easily, get work, do whatever he wanted. Now, first he stayed at his grandma's house while he settled in and got, his, got himself established in the building boom, moving to a nice place in Bonton Beach, Florida. Now, construction and real estate would give Wilder the ability to afford fast cars and live in luxury. Now, Wilder's modelling scam worked because he approached many young girls and women. It was a percentage game. The more he stalked and tried his luck, the percentages dictated that eventually he would claim another victim. On the other hand, the more he did this, the more likely it would be that he would get reported to police. But just think, back in the day, rape victims had an even harder time than they do today. They would get a hard time from the cops, society, and in the courtroom. You, you know, they'd say things like she had it coming to her. She was wearing a miniskirt and all that bullshit. So there was a huge barrier if you tried to get justice and Wilder took this into his, his calculations. He was arrested in March 1971 at Pompano Beach, north of Fort Lauderdale. He tried to pick up a teenager with this modelling scam, but he was a bit too quick to ask for nudes, and she reported him. He was charged with disorderly conduct and fined $15 plus $10 court fees. Now, whenever he'd been caught in the past, he would act remorseful, try to lessen his culpability, and it seemed to do the trick and keep him out of jail. Then, as soon as he was let go, he would go straight back to doing it again. As he crawled up the social ladder, he kept a low profile, eventually meeting and living with a woman for seven or eight years. He set up a dog breeding business with her and they moved to a semi-rural place in Loxahatchee, Lox and that's west of Palm Beach. My audio podcast, I tried that 50 times to get it right. I did get it right, I think. She said, she said he was vain, he liked named goods and didn't have many close friends at all. Only one who was a business partner. She also said he was a neat freak. He expected a home when he got home and when he went to the beach, he wouldn't go for a swim. He'd go with his camera, especially on weekends when he would tell her he was actually going to the office. Now, in contrast to his ex-wife, she said sex was pretty normal. Now, I reckon that this was just the partnership of convenience for Wilder, someone to take care of the domestic things, to have regular sex with, and someone who didn't question what he did when he was out and about. Now, she would eventually find a stash of his photos. Again, they were all of young women in bikinis at local beaches. She eventually got tired of his affairs and this ended their relationship, but they would remain friends. She said that his greatest fear of all was ending up in jail. So there you go. Friday the 1st of October 1976 at Boca Raton, south of his place, he had stalked a young 16-year-old girl. Now, from what I can gather, she was the daughter of one of the clients that he'd done some construction work for. She'd gone out to buy some smokes and on her return, Wilder had parked his car as if it had broken down. Now, he'd been stalking her. He knew who was in the house, who wasn't, the whole thing. So he just didn't break down at the front. Now, as she walked past him, he called her over to help him, saying that he had, had fixed a leak in the roof of her family home. He asked if she would take him back to her place where he could finish the repairs to his truck. She agreed and they jumped in the truck and drove off. Now, funny, this broken down truck now is working fine. Now, he then said, oh, look, first, can I go and see my boss? I've just got to drop in there. It's not far away. She didn't think much of it. But then he pulled over to a secluded area and he flashed his dick at her. 
He told her that she was going to do everything he told her to do. He demanded she jack him off now as he slapped her face. He dragged her out of the truck, ripped open her shirt and groped her boobs. She was screaming, but then she decided to try and do what he said just to try and make him calm down and hopefully prevent him from raping her. He then told her to get back in the truck, but the truck was bogged. He got it free and they drove off. Now, then he demanded that she suck him off and the only reason she did anything was to just try and calm him down, like self-preservation. He then changed, after all this, he changed from being violent to being gentle trying to convince her that he was never going to rape her, he was just mucking around, and that she'd actually enjoyed it and wanted it. He then offered to take her to the cops to report him if she wanted to, and in the end, he would drop her off near her boyfriend's place. But before that, he was chatting like nothing had happened. He even offered to get her a job at the construction firm that he worked for. She ended up telling her parents, and they went to the construction company that Wilder worked for. They waited for him to turn up, and she pointed him out. The sheriff was called and they took him downtown. He was charged with sexual battery and tried to lessen his culpability by saying he'd actually offered to take it to the sheriff after the incident. He apologised to the owner of the construction firm as well. Now he's trying to sweet talk his way out of it, basically saying, look, I was only mucking around, we were having a bit of fun, she was enjoying it, might have got out of hand a little bit, but... Basically, hey, I offered to take it down to the cops back then, so what have I got to hide? So he's really just trying to sweet talk his way out of it. Now, he was assessed for his fitness to stand trial. The psychiatrist said that he was not a mentally disordered sex offender. He's not insane and does not have a mental disorder. He then said that he's not dangerous in other regards to sexual offences. Now, how fucking wrong can you be? He pleaded not guilty to the charges, even though he's already admitted he did it, because he he said that she'd given him a certain amount of consent. He'd be found not guilty. He moved out of the area, who's now known as a predator, and he moved to Bonton Beach. With his girlfriend leaving him in 1979, he went back to Australia to visit his parents. Now, he didn't stay long there, and the police didn't question him over the Wanda Beach murders either. Now, he's back in the country. He then went back to Florida. Now, the reason they didn't question him is because back then, it's not like today you'd be on a computer list forever. If you come into the country, they'll see it, it'll flag you. Back then, they used to have a 90-day list. And after 90 days, you'd drop off the list. So he'd been gone well over 90 days. So when he came back, there was no flag to say he was in the country. He didn't stay long. Then he went back to Florida. Now, with no girlfriend, he would be seen about town with one or more escorts. He liked them white, pretty, big busted and dumb. Now, the latter would be because they wouldn't fall for his bullshit. He just wanted stupid people. Now, just a side note, when he was in Australia, he used his American accent to get the girls. And now he's in America, he used his Australian accent for the exact same thing. In 1980, on the 21st of June, he targeted two 18-year-old girls at Palm Beach. He used two girls to lure them in who were probably paid escorts that he'd hired to help him. They they looked like twins. He went back to this modelling scam, posing as an agent for Barbizon Modelling, a well-known acting and modelling firm. Now, with the two twin girls and using the modelling agency, these Two that he approached were put at ease. There's a couple of women there, everything should be fine. Now he suggested test shots at first, then asked them to take off their bras. He told them they couldn't be shy if they wanted to make it in modelling. Now they went to the toilet, so they took off his bra. Now he's not holding a camera right, so as they came out of the toilet, he told them to walk past the entrance of a department store and he was saying, oh, my eyes are my camera. By this stage, the twin escorts he'd hired to lure the girls in had disappeared out of sight. Now, Wilder then told the two girls he had to get equipment from his car and he just walked off saying, just wait for me here. Now, when he walked to his car, the twins ended up walking past these two girls and said, we're going home. Good luck. They knew what was the scam. They got the two girls in for him. They got paid and they were going home. Now, when Wilder came back, there was no camera. His equipment was T-shirts 
with Barbizon written on the back. Now he told them, we're all going to Jefferson Mall. Now they had a car, but he wanted one of them to go with him. They declined the offer and they met him at the mall where there was a new Ford Thunderbird with a model getting photos taken. Wilder told the girls that he'd actually organised this shoot. Long story short, Wilder splits the girls up. He drugged one and got her into the back of his truck and drove to a quiet part around the back of the building where he raped her. The other girl got worried and security was alerted. Now, when this girl had just been raped, just turned up, she was staggering around, she was a bit woozy. They were taken to police and statements were taken. Now, the raped girl was checked over. She had fingernails, scrapes, semen samples, all that deal. Now, even though DNA forensic was pretty much years away, blood types could be determined. The semen sample came back as type A secreta, and that's Wilder. Now, she had no drugs in her system, but some pizza Wilder had given her, the leftover bit had been thrown into a dumpster. They recovered that, and it tested positive for LSD. Now, the fact that she had no trace of this in her body probably meant it had already metabolised and was untraceable. That's why she was a, a bit woozy. Now, the girls didn't have Wilder's rego of his truck, but they described him really well. Now, the police had a pretty good database. They went through it with Wilder's MO and description. The cops were able to narrow it down to him as a prime suspect because the girls picked him out of a photo lineup and he was arrested on July 3rd, 1980. He was, remorse, he was remorseful in the back of the cop car. He was being driven downtown. He said he'd been seeing a doctor for his problems and he did pose as a modelling agent to take photos of girls. It's something he did. He again tries to lessen his culpability in this crime. He would be charged with sexual battery, but this time he pleaded guilty in a deal that got him probation for five years with good behaviour conditions and mental health care conditions. He got away with it again. Okay, so this is where I'm going to lead this one part of the Christopher Wilder case. Next week, we're still in 1980 and things are going to escalate, to escalate dramatically, I can tell you. Okay, so that's the end of part one. Get ready for the next episode. It really gets crazy. If you want to support the island, there are links in the description for Patreon, PayPal and merch. Please feel free to comment, like and subscribe and I would truly appreciate if you share the channel. Hit the bell to be notified. Now, I am shadow banned by YouTube because of the way I have scripted the show. I may well keep this YouTube version, but maybe censor it for a while to see how the numbers go. Look, if they do go up, I may keep an uncensored version on YouTube and just leave a... Uh, keep a censored version on YouTube and put an uncensored version on Patreon. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Well, that's it. I've been your host, Cambo. You've been watching True Crime Island. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night. Boom, fucker,